I am going to talk about the circuits of sensation. It is the circuitry that brings sensory information of the world to our brains that we use to actually know what's out there. Without this sensory circuitry, we would be, you know, like brains in bowls, <laughs> unable to interface with the world. Um, it is this circuitry that brings us um, almost matrix-like sort of, uh, you know, inputs about the world. This circuitry not only gives us all of this and creates this rich world for us to live in, but it also limits us, right? Because the first thing you realize is that if you don't get information in via your circuitry, you don't know it's there. You don't know it's there. Um, I'll give you an example. You know that we see in a narrow bandwidth of the electromagnetic spectrum, a very, very narrow bandwidth. Wavelengths on this side, wavelengths on that side, we don't know they're there. We don't know anything is there if it is emitting beyond the bandwidth that we can see. So, I mean, what is the world like? We think the world is what we receive by way of sensory information. So studying how the circuitry forms in some sense is studying the circuitry that gives us our world and also limits it. So with that little philosophical beginning, um, so this is the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research's Kulaba campus, Mumbai, uh, by the Arabian Sea. If you haven't visited, I hope we can host you sometime after this dreadful COVID is passed. Um, and this, this sort of illustrates the senses I'm going to talk about. Okay, you can kind of hear the music. Uh, you can, in order to play the piano, you need touch resolution, right? You need your fingers, the, the, the keyboard was designed for human-sized fingers. If the keys were very, very narrow, we would not have the resolution to play this note or that note. We would be pressing two keys at once. Right? So we create our world to match our sensory resolution. Um, vision, for example, we would not be able to see the black keys as distinct from each other uh, in the white if they weren't spaced enough for us to be able to see them. So this in some sense represents three of the five senses. And having this circuitry form in the embryo the way it is supposed to gives us our sensory abilities. Now, sensory circuitry is really our pipeline to the exterior world. This, this is a, a, a image showing all of the nerves in the human brain. Okay, this riot of color and complexity, this is not a model system for anything, but this is what we aspire to study using simpler model systems. All right, I'm going to conduct a little uh, uh, experiment with you, okay? Uh, Imagine, if you will, a tennis net. You've all seen one. If you haven't, here it is. Now close your eyes and use your probes, your fingers, okay, to poke at this material, this strange material that you don't know what it is, and answer, does this material have holes? <laughs> okay, certainly you can imagine your fingers going through it, right? Your whole arm would go through it. Of course it has holes. Okay, now imagine a mosquito net. And now if you close your eyes and feel, you're going to feel at best a rough surface. You're just going to feel the rough texture, but you're not going to be able to tell with these probes, okay, that this material has holes. You just don't have the resolution. If I give you a toothpick, all of a sudden you've made the probe narrow, or all of a sudden you'll be able to tell it has holes, right? So what I'm trying to say is sensory resolution is everything. Sensory resolution is what allows us to sample our world as best we can, as best we can. Now, there are some things that, you know, we're not going to be able to see with toothpicks and so on. And that's, that's why we have creatively invented the electron microscope, the X-ray machine. Why do we look, why do we use those things? Because they have much, much narrower wavelengths and those probes can tell us things that the naked eye cannot or even the assisted uh, uh, regular microscope cannot. Okay. So how, how does all this arise? How does all of this circuitry get wired up? Now, this is my fanciful cartoon of how a brain can be built. Obviously, this is not how you can build a, a computer. A computer, yeah, you can buy parts, you know, motherboards and RAM chips and processors and, you know, wire them up. 
but the brain has to be grown. I mean, would that, you know, you could get a nice bright idea and plant it in the brain when you want it. Yeah, the brain has to be grown from one cell. Okay, so uh, much as the brain fascinated me right from when I was in the 12th standard, the development of it gripped me in some sense even more. The brain functions because of how it develops. Development is what allows the brain to wire up and bring about its function. So development is everything. If the development goes this way or that way, all of a sudden the brain function has changed, right? So here are two little movies that I'll share with you just to sort of, I mean, no matter how many times I look at them, I, am, I, I marvel at this fantastic developmental machine that is an egg. Okay, so here is a cartoon of a human egg, fertilized egg, and here's a cartoon of a fish egg. And let's start. One cell becomes two, four, eight, 16, both of them. And then in both of them, you have this ball of cells, which in the human embeds itself in the uterine wall and forms the placenta. Okay, um, this little blue line here is going to become the embryo. The fish doesn't need to do all of this work with the placenta. And I'm going to stop this here and say, look at these little choppy, choppy dots. This is the beginning of what will be the vertebral column. Okay, the elements, this musculature and so on. And the same thing is going to happen in the fish. Watch here. You're soon going to see the beginnings of a nice uh, segmental, you know, bones of the spine, the musculature and so on. Come on. And let's let the human catch up now. You can see the little limb bud, the little eye. Here too in the fish, you have an eye coming up. The limbs growing longer. So this takes nine months. This, we're at barely three days, okay? So why is one so much faster than the other, okay? Because the amount of the job they do is different and the end goal is different, okay? Um, first, the fish comes with the nutrients. The fish egg has nutrients packaged in it, the yolk. Uh, the human has to build its placenta and first create the nutrient structure. So in fact, as the embryo grows, so does the placenta. They have to keep pace with each other. And then the human spends a lot of time de developing the large brain, the large cerebral cortex that is going to be necessary for the human to function. When the human baby is born, everything is not quite completely wired up in place. A human baby lies there looking awfully cute. It can't even move, whereas the fish, This is barely three days and suddenly it begins to twitch. Muscles already wired up. Flick, 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 flick. And suddenly sayonara, right? <laughs> and, and you know, it's not just fish, right? Other mammals do it too. A newborn um, 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 calf will get up on spindly legs and start walking right away. The human doesn't do that because it's born with the rest of its body barely in place all of the time. Large amounts of it has gone into shaping the brain. And these are just, sort of a uh, uh, different uh, species with different trajectories. But within all of this complex body and brain and organ system matching, uh, the brain has to move its cells around and assemble itself. So this is a slice culture of a mouse brain where some neurons are labeled with this fluorescent red uh, um, dye. Uh, this is from a colleague in the field, an eminent scientist, Kazunori Nakajima from Kobe University in Japan. I share it with his permission. And just watch the, watch, watch the cells move. It's just, uh, uh, this happens in our brains as they form. Right? Look at these cells dart around. Um, it seems a little chaotic, but you know, each cell knows where it's going. Each cell knows what it's supposed to do. And each cell is equipped with the, the, the sensors and the machinery to execute complex motions so that the neurons of the brain can migrate to where they're supposed to go. And then similarly, the wires, the, the, the dendrites and the axons, the input and the output wires grow. 
and connect the way they're supposed to. So this is the magic and mystery that we seek to study. Um, there's a lot of questions or, or comments popping up in the chat box. I'm not sure. I, oh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll, uh, anytime there is actually a question that uh, you would like me to interrupt the talk for, I'm delighted to. This talk is for you. So uh, it would be okay if uh, maybe the, the host could uh, uh, interrupt and say, or oh, there's a question I need to take, or if the person is allowed to unmute, that's completely fine with me. Okay, so please do definitely, interrupt. Definitely. I will definitely uh, relay the questions to you right now. We have just got some amazing, incredible, wow, comments coming in. I And, and you know... I, no matter how many times I see this movie, I find it amazing and incredible and wow. I mean, this happens in every little mouse that's running around the street, okay? Every insect, every, every little animal is not just a human thing. Every animal that, you know, develops a functioning uh, system, uh, a functioning body, has a functioning control system. And this has to happen for every single animal to do its thing. Uh, the, the, the fascination of this is, is why I'm in neuroscience. And this is why I'm in developmental neuroscience, because I want to see how it is all created. Okay, so let me show you a few cartoons to, you know, it's wonderful to say, oh, how is the brain built? This, this was my sort of fascination in 12th standard. Um, this, is the, this, is the, this is the extent of the job I had. Okay, this was a picture that I saw in my very first uh, neuroscience class in graduate school. This is a simplified diagram of the visual system. Simplified. This could be a crazy, you know, metro routing system for a complex city, and this is a simplified version. Now, not only that, each neuron, here is A, example of a neuron. Each neuron, all of these red dots on these, uh, uh, so all of these are dendrites, and one somewhere is an axon. Each neuron connects with other neurons, large numbers of connections. The human brain is thought to have 100 billion neurons, and each of them is thought to make between 1,000 and 10,000 connections with other neurons. So look at all these red dots. Right? Each one is where some other neuron is coming connected with this. And then, hello, my person. That's why you have all of these wires, okay? So the color code here is simply things going in a direction have one color, and the minute it changes direction, it changes color. So these are all large tracts of axons, large wires that are connecting. This, as I said, is not a model system. You cannot study this, nor will somebody kindly give me their brain to study. So we use the model system of the mouse in which we can study how sensory circuitry is wired. So here is a section of a mouse brain. This is a section of a brain where the sensory pathway is fluorescent green. And you can see this bundle that courses under this blue strip. The blue strip is the cerebral cortex. And you can see that these green neurons originate from here deep within, and they curve and then they course under the cerebral cortex. How these nerves make it there and how they wire up is the subject of what I'm going to share with you today. All right. Now, sensation has to have a good resolution, right? You all know that when you want to get a better picture, you go out and buy a you know more megapixel camera, right? The more the megapixels you devote to something, the better the resolution you're going to have, right? Okay. Similarly, if cortex is the processor, okay, your cerebral cortex is the processor, if your sensory nerves connect to a bigger patch of cortex, you're going to have more cortex processing signal from that area, right? Uh, let's consider the, 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 the touch space, okay? If sensory nerves from my arm are going to go to the brain, if they spread out over a larger patch of cortex, I'm going to be able to have better resolution in my arm. Resolution means if you close your eyes and somebody touches you with two fingers, are they two fingers or one, right? That turns out that you have excellent resolution in your fingers. You have excellent resolution around your lips, okay, where two very nearby points will be perceived as different. The same distance, you know, somewhere here will not be perceived as different, okay? That's because the brain has limited resources. Cortex is limited in its size, right, finally. So it's a very clever strategy. This is not a nice uniform one-to-one -one mapping of every bit of your body onto your brain. There is a mapping, but it's not the same density. If I showed you a picture of how the body would look proportional to the area of brain it connects to in terms of sensation, here's what we would look like. Okay, 
so this is telling you that greatly, overwhelmingly, our cortex processes, uh, our mouth, the front of our face, our tongue, uh, certainly our hands, and very, very disproportionately small is the rest of our body. Okay, this, this makes good sense, right? So similarly for the visual system, the fovea, the very center, uh, uh, the, the high density, where high density photoreceptors are, that occupies a large part of the cortical territory. So you have high resolution in some parts, low resolution in other parts. And this is an effective strategy for getting the job done effectively. Otherwise, cortex would just be uniformly divided. And, you know, in areas of your body where you don't really care very much about resolution, you wouldn't, you know, you would have resolution. And here, where you're really sampling the world, you wouldn't. Okay, now in our model system, the mouse. Evolution has conserved this mechanism. Okay, the same mechanism applies. The same strategy applies. And for the mouse, uh, not only are the uh, forelimbs uh, important, uh, you've seen my sort of whole things with their forelimbs and their upper and lower jaw, but they have whiskers and the mouse whiskers, in fact, sense the world, much as our fingers sample the world. Okay, Peggy Mason in her talk this morning mentioned how when two mice meet each other, they sort of exchange a little whisker shake. Okay, so the mouse uses whiskers, the way we would use our fingers. And indeed then, if you represent the mouse scaled to the area of cortex that it's a uh, uh, sensory cortex that its uh, skin surface connects to, here's what you would get. A large upper jaw, lower jaw, basically the same oral mouth parts, uh, larger forelimb representation, not so much hind limb and rest of body, but look at this, what are these, okay? This is the whisker pad. Whiskers are very precisely connected up with the brain. And there are not a random number of whiskers. Each of these whiskers are actually names and numbers. Okay, that's it's, it's very interesting. Let me just show this to you. Um, this is a, a schematic of the pathway from the whiskers to the brain. It's not a direct pathway. It goes through a stage in the hindbrain, a stage in the thalamus, and then the brain. Okay, but basically each whisker accesses a patch in the brain. So the C2 whisker and the C3 whisker, for example which means that if you stimulate one whisker of the mouse, you're going to primarily be able to record from one part of the cortex. And in the cortex, these structures have give, been given an interesting name. They've been called barrels, the cortical barrels. Okay, are there really barrels in the brain? Okay, these were named by Woosley and Van der Luce. Uh, and I think they must have liked beer because this is what stacks and stacks of beer barrels look like. And if you look at the outer surface of the mouse brain, Okay, if you flatten it out and stain it up for cytochrome oxidase, that's an enzyme that's found in mitochondria. Uh, 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 in, and, and this is particularly dense in cells that are using a lot of energy. Here's what you see. Okay, so these are the, at the, the barrels. This is the primary barrel field. And you can see the A, B, C, D, E rows and the one, two, three. Right, so you can do, so why, why am I belaboring the point? Because barrels are easy to identify. And looking at whether, you know, if you cut out two whiskers, then do the barrels go away or not? It becomes a model system where you can do a perturbation and you have a readout. You have a readout of brain wiring okay, by looking at the barrels. Okay, so what did we find? We found a gene that controls the formation of the sensory pathway that eventually creates the barrels. Okay, the brain does not have this barrel formation until the sensory nerves go in and they are whisker specific sensory nerves. So when the sensory nerves enter the cortex, okay, they whisker specific input will cluster in the middle of cortical cells and the cortical cells will form these circles, okay, or called barrels, right? So until then the cortical cells are sort of uniform, it's only this input that comes in that, you know, you have whisker specific. Cool, are we cool so far? Should I take a look at the chat box? So ma'am, we do have a question come in. Um, mouse, so yeah, mouse unculus. It's not called a home unculus, okay? Mouse unculus. <laughs> okay, yes. Can resolution sensing be enhanced by training? <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, for this, I'm going to ask you to come to uh, the Tata Lit Live Festival, which is ongoing. Um, tomorrow, an amazing neuroscientist, David Eagleman, will talk about his book, Live Wired. And I have the privilege of interviewing him, being in conversation with him tomorrow at 11. Uh, just Google Tata Lit Live uh, and you'll see this. Or if you uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, at Shubha uh, I will soon post information about this. 
um, yes, resolution sensing can be enhanced. Not only that, he's pushed the limits of what sensory perception can do and where it can take you. It will boggle your mind. I strongly encourage you to come. Yeah. Okay, um, so this, these are controls. Controls normal mice to which nothing has been done. And I'm summarizing here the work of a wonderful student, Ashwin Shetty, who is now doing a postdoc at Harvard. Ashwin, there. Ashwin showed that when you knock out this gene, okay, this is a transcription factor LHX2, when you knock out this gene in the cortex, you lose the barrels. Here it is in a flat mount, and here it is in section. Remember I said that the cortical neurons are not sort of circled around the inputs until the inputs come in? Well, here it looks like there aren't any inputs, and here the cortical neurons haven't circled because there haven't been any inputs. Now, the cool thing about this finding, which he published some years ago, it was, his, it was the centerpiece of his thesis. The cool thing about this finding is that we didn't knock out this gene in the entire mouse body. We didn't knock it out in the nerves that were coming in. We only knocked it out in the cortex. Okay, we did nothing to the nerves. They came from the whiskers, from the hindbrain, from the thalamus, nicely segregated, you know. But when they hit the cortex, what happened? Okay, what happened? I hope knockout technology is something that's familiar to everybody. Uh, if it's not, maybe the host can just let me know and I'll describe it a little bit. Um, it would be great if you could describe it because we do have a very diverse set of people now. So just in okay. brief. All right. So if there are people who have no idea what a knockout is, I'll be happy to say it. I'll, I'll use a metaphor, okay? Um, suppose you folks have never ever seen an alarm clock, okay? No, no, wait. CRISPR-Cas9, you know, we were doing gene knockouts long before CRISPR was a thing. Okay. <laughs> um, suppose you've never seen an alarm clock, and I'm betting many of you may not have because you all have cell phones, right? But imagine those old style alarm clocks in Mickey Mouse cartoons. <laughs> okay, and imagine one landed in from the sky. And you notice that it's our hand moved, and it's minute hand moved faster, and it's second hand moved faster still. And you open it and you look at all the gears. And you go, hmm, these gears are moving, and those hands are moving. Maybe the gears have something to do with the hands moving. And you say, okay. I'm going to knock out one gear, okay? And I'm going to see what it does to the mechanism. And you discover when you knock out a particular gear that the hour hand still moves, but the minute hand has stopped. And you say, okay, this suggests, it doesn't show, it suggests that this gear might have something to do with the movement of the uh, second, of the minute hand. Because you see, the second hand may also stop. The second hand movement may be linked to the minute hand movement. So your gear may have on another hand and it's impossible to tell by this very crude experiment of knocking out one gear right so which is why a phd takes five years because you have to make very precise experiments very precise hypotheses ask the question this way and that way and then in combination answer it okay so broadly that's that's the idea of a gene knockout how it is done is something you can read up now it, it's it can be done by crispr cas now but it was done using other technology before and the important thing is we can knock out a gene in the tissue of our choice, okay, using a tissue specific driver. So if you knock out this gene only in the cortex and the input nerves are all okay, somehow there's a problem when they enter the cortex. So what is that problem? This is the subject of a sort of Alice in Wonderland like, of, like story. And what uh, my student Suranjana Pal worked on for her thesis, what happens to these nerves? So this is a cartoon. Here's where the nerves start. They take this U shape, they enter this, this gray ribbon is cerebral cortex. They enter the cerebral cortex and then they penetrate it and ideally form barrels, okay? And here is the section of the mouse. The nerves are coursing under the cortex and this is an embryo section, so they haven't yet entered the cortex. Okay, they haven't had time to enter. Okay, so now what do we do with this system? Suranjan so asked then, how does the circuitry form? And here's what she did. Uh, in collaboration with uh, a postdoc named Gita Gurbole and a master's student, Tuli Pramanik, okay, uh, who um, developed a way of labeling these nerves and making them green so that we could see them. Now, in the normal mouse brain, this is a relatively mature mouse. 
and this is a section, and you can see these clumps, okay, the barrels have formed. Yeah. And I'll show them to you in high match just because it looks gorgeous. So this down here is a pathway that has just come in coursing under the cortex and look at how uh, these thin, like each, each of them is, you know, an axon or a cluster of axons. And you can see how they've nicely clumped okay, inside the barrels. Now here is the mutant, the mutant where our gene of interest is knocked out only in the cortex. As expected in section, there's hide no hair of a barrel, you know, maybe one little cluster here, but there's no barrel seen. And look here, okay, the pathway has entered fine as we expected it would, but it is somehow unable to penetrate the cortex. And now this made us hypothesize that maybe we have a sort of hostile cortex kind of scenario. Maybe our gene in the cortex is functioning to make the cortex permissive. And when you take out the gene from the cortex, the territory is no longer permissive, the nerves can't enter. Nice hypothesis. If it was hostile then, it would have been hostile back in the embryo when the pathway first came. Okay, this is a, a sort of postnatal, slightly mature cortex. All right, so they looked in the embryo. And lo and behold, here's what they found. Here's the control. And you can see the pathway is coursing under the cortex, but it hasn't yet penetrated. Okay, because it's an embryonic stage. And here in the mutant, Contrary to this whole hostile cortex, hostile cortex hypo hypothesis, you can see that you have, in fact, a profusion of nerves prematurely entering the cortex when they shouldn't. It's too early. Okay, it's too early. The normal pattern is that they course under the cortex and they wait here for a little while, while the cortex itself assembles, the neurons there are migrating and forming. This waiting period is somehow just short and there's premature innovation and it's, you know, not right. Why this premature innovation? Okay, and so it's known in the field that if you mess with this pathway in a manner such that the axons don't find their targets, they eventually withdraw and retract and sort of wither away, which is what you're seeing here. So by just looking earlier in time, our hypothesis has changed now. This is not the primary defect. This is a cause of, very likely to be the cause of, this overgrowth and unable to reach the right target and premature growth and so on. So this is the primary defect. So now we're looking at something else altogether. What would make these axons overgrow? Okay, but that we have to ask what makes them normally stay and not penetrate the cortex early. And it is known that there is a key structure, a key row of neurons that is necessary to make the axons, sensory axons wait. Okay, this is called the subplate. You can think of it as a park and hold array for incoming nerves. So here is the, income, the, the pathway that I showed you before. And here in high mag is this row of blue cells that form the subplate. And here is where these axons normally come and wait. So Suranjana hypothesized that maybe something is wrong with the subplate. And I'm not going to complete the story because we don't have the full answer, but the short answer is definitely something is wrong. Here is the normal tightly packed subplate. And this is a mature brain. So you can see that the, uh, you see little barrels, even though they're not stained up, you can see little, little clusters here. <laughs> okay, so this is a normal brain. And this is a tightly packed subplate. And here in the mutant, okay, the cortex specific LHX2 mutant, you can see that the subplate is disorganized. It's not packed, it's got gaps in it. Okay, so not only is it disorganized, but also each cell here is a mutant cell. So it may be that LHX2 is required for as yet unknown properties of the subplate that are necessary for these axons to grow. But we know some of the properties. In collaboration with Upinder Bhalla's lab and his student Dipanvita, uh, Suranjana took these mice to Bangalore, NCBS Bangalore, and they sectioned the mice and they recorded from these subplate neurons. And they found that these mutant subplate neurons are way more inactive than the normal ones. And they are inactive right in the embryo, right when the nerves come in and they touch the subplate. So we know some of what the problem is. And it may be that this inactivity is what's causing the axons to not notice there's a subplate and just profusion, you know, grow up to the cortex as if, you know, they didn't know the subplate was there. So this is the sort of precipice on which we are right now. Can you imagine what an exciting time it must be <laughs> right now for the people doing the next experiment and the next experiment in the lab? Because we don't know exactly what's what the problem, you know, 
we, we don't know which of these properties is relevant and we're trying to find out. But meanwhile, meanwhile, okay. So here's a cartoon of the brain again. And meanwhile, while Suranjana was busy looking at the barrels, this is almost like a TV series where something is happening in one city, there's a lot of drama, and then suddenly the camera cuts and some other drama is happening in some other city. So here is our other city or other country. Okay, over in the hippocampus, here, this yellow structure, the structure that records memories, okay, the Kelly Chexto mutant has other problems. Okay. What, what I'm trying to trying to bring out is that the same gene, the same protein, LHX2, it's like a tool, and it does different things in different parts of the brain. And we've been privileged to basically discover a few of them. So while the LHX2 is necessary for subplate properties, so that these axons, sensory axons, may grow in properly and not overgrow too early, and therefore then form barrels properly, so that the mouse may feel. So I've used the sensory modality, but you know, this particular mouse, because its sensory pathway doesn't, you know, wire up properly, it, it overgrows and then it shrinks back and then the cortex doesn't get sensory information. So although there's nothing wrong with its eyes or ears or its skin, and there's nothing wrong with the pathway of nerves that goes in, because these nerves cannot access the cortex, this mouse can neither feel sensation nor see nor hear, okay, because of one gene that was removed from the cortex. So look at what a profound effect this can have. And this one gene can control an entire, the, the mouse's experience of the world. Okay, interestingly, the olfactory bulb seems to be connected okay. So the mouse is probably living in its cage in our animal house based entirely on smell. Okay, so meanwhile, while all of this drama is happening in the sensory cortex, over in the hippocampus, okay, in parallel with Ashwin's study, another pair of very talented students were studying what happens in the recorder of memories, okay? And we stumbled upon a mechanism as to how the hippocampus is built. So I'm now going to share with you a tiny vignette of what's happening in the hippocampus. Okay. And before that, we have a small question in the audience. Uh, someone wants to know what is the subplate made up of? The subplate is neuronal. It, has neur it is made of neurons the earliest spawn neurons of the cerebral cortex. And they have electrical properties and they make connections with other neurons and with these, presumably with these incoming sensory nerves, we don't know. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, so this is a time axis and these are hippocampal stem cells. Each of these is going to produce hippocampal neurons and hippocampal support cells. And what Lakshmi noticed, Lakshmi Subramanian, is that early in development, hippocampal progenitors have high levels of LHX2 and with time in gestation, the levels of LHX2 drop. And this intrigued her because it correlated beautifully with the fact that early progenitors make neurons and later progenitors produce glia. A progenitor is a stem cell. It will divide and proliferate and make copies of itself, but then it will also produce post-mitotic cells, which early are neurons and later on are support cells, okay? This is actually a common theme across the central nervous system, not just in the hippocampus, but in the entire central nervous system, in the spinal cord, in the retina, of all vertebrates, of the mouse, the fish, the frog, the human, neurons are made before glia and they come from the same progenitor cell. So this question is called when the neuron glia cell fate switch, at what point and how does a, 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 a progenitor, a stem cell know it's made enough neurons, it's now going to start making glia. Because this decides how many neurons the hippocampus has, right? And how many support cells the hippocampus has. Well, so two very talented students, Lakshmi Subramanian and Anandita Sarkar, uh, took on this project. And they took on, in some sense, two halves of this project. I'll show you in a little bit. Um, Lakshmi would sing beautiful old film songs as she pipetted them. It was beautiful. When, you, when her sections were going well, you could hear her sing. And Anandita here is being held back by a colleague because she had a reputation that whenever there was any cake or chocolate or any food product available in the lab, she would somehow manage to get there first and get the biggest piece. <laughs> so she's being restrained from doing so <laughs> in the interest of fairness. Okay, so Lakshmi and Anandita took on 
two aspects of this problem. And Lakshmi showed very beautifully for her thesis that removing LHX2 from these early progenitors induces them to prematurely form glia. And Anandita showed that augmenting LHX2 in these late progenitors prolongs the production of neurons. So together they showed that LHX2 is both necessary and sufficient to control the neuron via cell fate switch in the hippocampus. Okay, and this was very cool. So not only did we have we found a mechanism, a central mechanism that decides how many of each to make, okay? But now we have a model where this number can be tweaked and we can ask, well, is it better to have more neurons? Okay, may or may not be, right? So this problem was taken up uh, by a postdoc in my lab, um, Archana Hayar. And here's what Archana has, uh, uh, it's beautiful image that Archana has produced. This is a normal hippocampus. All the blue cells are normal cells. And here is a hippocampus with extra neurons, okay? Each green dot with its arbor, and this is Archana, is an extra neuron that wasn't there, that wasn't supposed to be there. And what Archana is working on currently, currently, okay, this is my last data slide. What Archana is working on currently is asking, do these extra neurons help or harm the function of the hippocampus? So more neurons may not always be good because especially if you've now got fewer support cells and maybe these extra neurons, which arose later during the glial phase, maybe they grow and they compete with the original neurons and maybe they mess up the connectivity, right? We don't know, but now we have a model to find out exactly what it means to have a balance of neurons and glia in the nervous system so that it may do its job. The whole motivation of development is uh, studying development is that it creates the fantastic computer, which if it's not done just right, finally the function gets affected. Okay, so here then is my summary slide. I've talked about two completely different portions of the brain, one the sensory cortex and one the hippocampus. And it turns out that the very same toolkit, LHX2, a transcription factor, seems to be necessary for different aspects in both tissues. Um, and I like to close with sort of saying, you know, I've said before that the, the, the joy of science is discovering things with your team, right? With your students and postdocs. And that the high moments are when people find cool things. And it's always nice. It's always nice for an advisor when you find that a student has fallen so in love with her project that she's kind of become one with it and she lives and breathes with it. And here then is a picture of a neuron, a gorgeous, beautiful neuron and a picture of a glial cell. And here is Anandita when she was feeling like a glia. And here she is when she was feeling like a neuron. Uh, I showed this when she defended her thesis. <laughs> you notice it was the same day. She switched from glia to neuron in the same day. So I'll close now and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.